All right, everyone. Good evening and hello to everyone joining us live at our event this evening and also watching us from around the world. Uh, my name is Brian Antolin. I am and the host of Future of Careers. Uh, today's session features a deep dive into the future of software engineering. Uh, we are very excited to have six amazingly talented and accomplished software leaders joining us to share their insight and perspective on the future of software. Before we get there, though, let me tell you a little bit about who we are, Line Run, and what we do. Uh, Line Run is an experiential career and industry education platform for tomorrow's workforce. We empower our community of leaders to connect, innovate, and grow through media, events, and programs such as this evening's session. We invite you to check out our website, linerun.co. That's L-I-N-E-R-U-N. And learn more about our podcast, classes, and career accelerator programs. So, Line Run. Uh, with that, uh, each member of our panel will briefly introduce themselves, and then we're gonna, from there, we're going to get to questions. Uh, let's start with Cassie. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Cassie Shum. Uh, I am the head of cloud and technical director for ThoughtWorks in North America. Uh, ThoughtWorks is um, an IT consultancy that's also global as well. I don't know if many people have heard of us, but a lot of people have heard of Martin Fowler, who's written a lot of the books around refactoring and things like that. And so he's our uh, chief science, uh, science officer. So that's, that's how we become a little bit famous. But I think what, uh, I, what I do right now is I primarily focus on cloud strategy and the partnerships with AWS, Google, and Azure, uh, and how do we better serve our clients by driving um, what we're calling um, modernization in a lot of the legacy and enterprise systems, and how to drive that to the cloud and really apply more cloud native uh, capabilities. So that's primarily what I'm doing right now. Um, how does my previous experience Fit in. So I've been at ThoughtWorks for over 10 years now, and before that, um, software engineer in a few other places. And even before that, I was actually in neuroscience, so kind of a different thing. Um, I would say that that has nothing to do with what I do right now. Um, and a lot of what I've learned uh, about applying some of these best engineering practices and things have been throughout my career in some of the companies I've worked at and primarily ThoughtWorks. So very exciting uh, stuff and excited to be here. Very cool to do this over Zoom. <laughs> All right, so I guess I'm next. Uh, so my name is Jacopo Daeli. Uh, I'm currently lead software engineer at GoDaddy. Uh, I work from home uh, here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm mostly like a uh, DevOps uh, backend infrastructure guy. I do a lot of, uh, you know, things related to uh, cloud migrations and service architecture and development. Um, mostly working daily with things like uh, Node.js, DynamoDB, uh, Amazon Aurora, Redis, Kubernetes. Um, during, you know, like I do, I do a lot of things for, you know, in, in terms of like cloud stuff for my company. I also write a lot of uh, open source, like DevOps open source tools. Uh, last year, uh, I released a software called um, Kubernetes External Secrets, which transparently converts secret store in third party uh, backend uh, secret services like uh, AWS, uh, Secrets Manager into Secrets Object for Kubernetes. Um, before that, I was in Paris. Uh, before, I mean, before coming here to the US, uh, I was in Paris. Uh, I was working as a head of engineering for a startup building a video tool, a video app. And before that, I was actually a chief software engineer for like a digital tech agency in London. Um, you know, I, I've been I've been around quite a while, so it's going to be very interesting for me to you know to contribute uh, and you know give a little bit of uh, view across uh, you know software engineering across like Europe and United States, which I think it's very different, um, especially in terms of like uh, the way uh, the way company you know work 
and uh, of course like salaries and all these type of things. Um, so yeah, I mean, looking forward to, you know, to answer some questions um, and, you know, if there are also uh, technical things that you're curious to, uh, to ask me, like feel free to, you know, to, to do that or just reach out later. Uh, I'll be more than happy to, you know, uh, try to do my best to answer your question. Hello, I'm Pooja Malpani. I'm the CTO of Bloomberg Media. I have an amazing set of teams that envision, execute, and maintain tools and products to build and deliver world-class journalism to our consumers around the world. Besides news media, I oversee marketing engineering, web and public cloud excellence groups across Bloomberg and our B2B media syndication systems. My job is to remove obstacles, course correct, and for the most part to get out of the way so, so the teams can focus on building best in class products. Roughly my time is spent on five things. The first is coaching managers and upcoming leaders regularly so that as a leadership team, we stay aligned on our values and our goals. Working on product engineering and culture strategy with the rest of Bloomberg Media leadership across product, marketing, editorial and ads technical excellence and direction to ensure that the teams are investing in long-term solutions with scale, resiliency, performance, and extensibility in mind. Uh, d &I efforts, including self-promotion workshops for uh, underrepresented groups across the company and other employee development, development programs. And finally, recruiting. In my early career, I spent several years as a software developer across web and mobile development under different managers. I have worn different hats in my mid-career, tech lead, team lead, manager. Those experiences are instrumental to how I shape my own management style with an emphasis on a bottoms up collaborative culture and an environment where hopefully most people are excited to come into work every day, excited to be here. That's great. Um, I'm Sarah Chips. I'm the director of community at Stack Overflow. Um, I also uh, co-founded two organizations, one called Jewelbots that helps uh, build uh, STEM toys for kids. And another is called Girl Develop It that teaches adult women how to code. Um, my day-to-day -day is mostly enabling the folks on our community team to ensure that folks in our uh, developer community. So Stack Overflow has the largest technical community in the world. And um, uh, our community team facilitates communication from the company to the community and vice versa. Um, and so my, much of my time is spent enabling folks uh, to do just that. Um, my background, so I've been a software engineer for 20 years. Um, and so uh, that has enabled me to um, become an active part of the software community and uh, therefore uh, better understand the needs of our technical community in general. Sorry, technical difficulty unmuting. Um, my name is Steve Kidding and I am the front end architect and senior principal engineer at Twilio. Um, so my job is to work across all the front end teams, whether that's working on some of our rich client side applications or modernizing our console dashboards for users of the Twilio API and figuring out like where are the common places that we can actually kind of like leverage collaboration. How do we actually share solutions to things. How do we figure out best practices and fun stuff along those lines. Um, prior to working at Twilio and uh, SendGrid, which was acquired by Twilio, I uh, was on the founding team for the Turing School of Software and, De Software and Design and started the front end program there, uh, which is a seven month program for taking people who are just really great humans and trying to turn them into really great software engineers that can be a valuable asset to the companies that they work at. Um, so I have a, a non-zero amount of experience trying to like rapidly prepare people for the current uh, software engineering industry as well as, you know, the foreseeable future. So I'm super excited to talk on this panel. All right. Not last but not least, I'm Tanu Agarwal. Um, 
I enjoy bringing uh, first iterations of products to market. And I've been very lucky in my career to have had several opportunities to do that. Um, whether it was, you know, in a startup or in a big company enterprise or where I am right now, which is the in-between. Uh, for more than half of my career, I've been an individual contributor. Uh, I was a tech leader. I love writing code as part of my job. And then I moved into engineering leadership, um, engineering management, and now, you know, almost coming to about 50-50 of uh, split in my uh, career. Um, the love still remains the same. I love building products. Um, and now I also like building organizations around the products that I build. Uh, my recent experience is in the uh, video streaming industry, um, where uh, basically, you know, streaming video on the internet. Uh, I've dabbled in both products, which are professionally generated content, like your online TV channels, or UGC content, user-generated content that I'm doing at uh, Twitch right now. Um, if you're not familiar with Twitch, um, don't know which rock you live under, but it's a global community. Uh, it's a platform that enables millions of people across the world to stream live what they're doing. They might be um, playing a game, they might be cooking, they might be singing, and then millions of people across the globe join them, watch them live and interact with them. So it turns out, you know, we have a lot of unpredictable interesting, unique live experiences and communities that we build around it. Um, I'm the director of engineering in the video platform team. As part of that team, we are responsible for making sure we have good quality, very high quality video streams, highly scalable and uh, with very low latency. That means the time between the broadcaster doing something and the time between the viewer being able to see that thing happening should be as short as possible. Um, we support tens of thousands of concurrent broadcasters uh, who live stream. And uh, while they do that, millions of people are watching them across the globe in real time. Um, personally, I'm an avid reader. I am a home baker and an aspiring writer. Thank you all so much for just sharing a little bit about you and what you're doing. It's really incredible. And we're so fortunate to have all of you here. Our first question, and we're going to go to Jacopo first, you know, based on your current role and responsibilities, how do you define software engineering and how has that definition evolved over time? So I think, you know, like you, you can answer this, you know, in a very long, with a very long answer or like, you know, you can, you can try to keep it short, but so software engineering for me, it's, it's, one thing first, it's engineering, right? So there is this uh, engineering part, which it's shared across like different type of engineers from like electrical engineer to civil engineer. So it's really like the fact to, uh, it's really the, the job of trying to solve problems and, and trying to, uh, to apply like a, like a, like a, almost like a, like let's say a rational solution to a problem, right? Uh, software engineering, it's the, like, it's basically doing, it's basically solving the problem first and then, uh, trying to apply, trying to use a solution that could be, uh, like created in a form of software. So, um, like a, like a computer program or something like that. But I really like for me, the, the, it's, it, you know, the, the most important part is it's the engineering part, which is like the part of like trying to solve a problem. And, and then try to apply, you know, a solution, which is in the case of software engineering, it's, it's, it's like, it's a software, it's a, it's a numeric solution. Uh, but you know, that, that, that at the end of the day solves a problem, like uh, an electrical engineer could solve a problem using, you know, electronic components. Um, to answer the second part of the question, which is like how sort of like the definition of software engineering evolved over time. I think, you know, the, <laughs> I mean, how long has been around so, like computers are been around for at least 50 years now right uh so i think you know from the first mainframe where you know people you know have a really really little accessibility to you know to this type of uh uh system to like personal computers and you know modern modern cloud infrastructures where you know a lot of a lot of the platform it's already built software engineering you know become like went from like trying to solve the problem of like we need a platform to like more customer facing problems 
So I would say that, you know, 50 years ago, software engineering, the problem of software engineering was like, and it was very linked to electronical engineering, was like, hey, we need a computer. So how we do that? Uh, and today, uh, you know, first of all, with the web, which is, you know, give, give a sort of like very solid infrastructure. Uh, and then like more and more with like uh, tons of APIs that, um, somehow facilitate uh, programmers to, to build their application, you know, uh, problems today are more like customer facing. So like how we can make uh, people's life better uh, or sometimes it's not even like making people's life better, but it's just more like how we can entertain uh, people's better. And um, that's, that's basically what is software engineering today. It's like, people writing software for uh, a lot of people, not, not everyone, people, some people still like, you know, work more on the, on the platform side, but a lot of folks just work on, you know, trying to improve the user experience. And uh, I would say that that's, you know, like what's, you, you know, what is software engineering today? Uh, it's like trying to, you know, improve uh, quality, of life for, for folks through like uh, digital solutions. Yeah, no, that's that's a great segue to, to what I was thinking about. I was actually pinging Brian. I was like, that's a big and big question, but I think that was kind of the point. Um, I think the thing that I surround myself with or I, I work with in terms of the word software engineering in my head is is really what Jacobo was talking about is really around this customer centricity. Like it is right now the tool that is being used to actually drive businesses and drive customer centricity and, and really the products that we um, put in front of people to make make things better, make communication better, make social media a thing. Like it, it is the tools that we're actually driving everything from. I think one of the things that I, I would say I originally thought software engineering was when I was a software developer and I was coding away, compiled it, it worked and woohoo, you know, like red green refactor, right? And, and that was pretty much my, my myopic thinking of software engineering and that's what that is. Um, I think with my own maturity, but with maturity of software engineering as a whole, um, it has grown from what I would categorize as a very simplistic, you know, three tier architecture all the way to everything right now. It encapsulates not only um, just writing that code, but it's really around quality. It's really around infrastructure as code, automation, cloud, uh, going from a you know, monolith to microservices, going into product thinking and actually going through, you know, uh, an evolutionary period. You know, we think about Amazon, you, you run it, you build it, you run it, you know, those types of things. So um, the way I kind of think about software engineering is like there are just so many facets now and and there's this cognitive overload instead of just compiling your code back in the day. It's everything. And so in, in terms of this, you know, this panel and what, what we're really talking about is the diversification of technologies, languages, uh, environments, infrastructure. Is, it's so wonderful right now. There's so many things to choose from that you can pick a niche in, in, in software engineering. So that's, I don't know, that's kind of where I'm, I, I view the world now. So it's definitely changed over the years, it's gotten more complicated. Um, can't know everything about it now. <laughs> um, great answer, uh, Cassie. I'm gonna change tacks a little bit and uh, share my personal journey through the decades of software engineering. <laughs> and uh, also then kind of think of how I think, view that software engineering has changed. So again, software engineering for me has always been about building products. Um, I love writing code, as Jacopo said, it's about solving a problem, filling a need. I, I love bringing products to market. It was, writing about, it was about writing good, clean code, maintainable code myself earlier on. And now it has evolved to you know, hiring the right kind of people, keeping them motivated, figuring out how they thrive, and empowering them to write that uh, very same code. Um, I've also come to, um, to appreciate the complexity of the business side of the problem, the whole enterprise of software engineering. When we start off as software engineers, uh, we are so focused on writing code and seeing it compile and enjoying that, that sometimes it's easy to forget that, you know, there is a purpose behind it, there's a problem you're solving, there is um, a, a product you're bringing to the market. Um, 
it's it's funny i, I you know uh, when i look back uh, two decades ago when i started my career back in india after high school i had uh, gotten into an admission into a, a pretty good engineering college and uh, i had to fight the 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 wisdom of those times where everyone was like oh you should do electrical engineering or electronics engineering what is this computer thing and boy am i glad i persisted because it's been a very very fun ride I've done everything, you know, I've seen transitions. And again, you can see that in hindsight, I would have never thought that we would have moved so much forward in this industry in 20 years, which is perhaps the biggest fun part of this industry for me. I've worked on analog devices, then it became digital. I've done assembly language coding and, you know, I can code in JavaScript as well. I just think of them as the opposite extremes. So um, it's, it's been an amazing uh, ride. I used to write software, I get it written now. But in terms of uh, software engineering, the evolution of it, if I look at it and if I try to, you know, put my head around, wrap my head around all the changes I've seen in the two decades, I think uh, I'd like to categorize them as, you know, first, the level of abstraction keeps on increasing. Um, so earlier we used to write code in um, assembly languages, then we came on to, you know, higher level languages like C, C++, moved on to Java, now you have Go, Python, JavaScript. So it's the level of abstraction that keeps on going. We would write code for on firmware, um, on embedded devices, and now you have cloud modules you can slip, uh, spin up in the cloud. So it's the level of abstraction that has resulted in, you know, even non-technical people being able to take on software engineering. I think for me, that's an amazing thing because it frees up the technical people to then work on, you know, harder technical problems, which is what I think we are moving towards. Um, so, so one is abstraction. The second category I would call out where I see it evolving is um, automation. You know, the things that we, we did, we just took for granted that we had to do ourselves. Configuring a router, for example. The other day I bought myself a new router, plugged it in, Bluetoothed it, and bingo, it was in service. <laughs> I remember the last time I did it four or five years ago, I had to sit and configure the firewall and do everything. So again, it's the automation that's coming in. Um, you know, the, the, the low code, no, clo uh, no uh, code uh, development platforms are coming in. They help software engineers to, or even non-software engineers to quickly write code and de uh, deliver applications. And finally, the third big one, you know, the buzzword of today, which is um, uh, autonomy uh, or artificial intelligence. Uh, we are writing software that will perhaps <coughs> eventually write software by itself. There are companies out there <clears throat> who are writing tests for your software using AI. So for me, that's where I'm seeing it evolving. Abstraction, automation, and autonomy. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, the, you know, I agree with like everyone. So I, like if I don't repeat something someone said, it's, you know. Um, one of the things that I, I think about is, um, you know, there's the question of how has software engineering changed? And then there's a the question of like, how have I changed in relation to software engineering as a like stable thing? I think with software engineering, what was said earlier that I just kind of want to highlight is this idea that like, I think it's probably increasingly harder to be like a everything developer right um and that it's gotten a lot bigger and like i think this, these the next question we talk about kind of goes into that a little bit more so i'll save some of that um what i think a lot about now is when i first started it was here's a problem i'm going to start throwing code at it until it's not a problem anymore right and i've been thinking a lot more about the in, the word engineering in software engineering right like ideally uh as engineers or architects whichever other words we've borrowed from other industries right if i was to build a bridge part of the goal is to build a bridge with as little material as needed like i don't get bonus points for like using extra metal and extra weight in the bridge at extra cost right and so the challenge of the engineering for me has been how do you actually do this with actually as little code as possible right and actually create an actual elegant solution for it and i think that's true of a lot of the more physical engineering that I'm starting to now over the last few years think a lot more about uh, coming to that elegant solution and not just yeah, yeah yeah just write a bunch of code but the actual design and thinking about a problem and uh, like applying like lateral thinking and different solutions to write less code to solve a problem because all code you have is a liability right it's all every line of code you have is a line that a bug could be in so the less code you have ideally um, the more 
more resilient it should be. And that's an art form in and of itself. Something that I want to just quickly add after just uh, listening to what Tani say about, you know, that she loves bringing a product to market. And I think this is like something very um, more modern in, in software engineering is also like this hybrid profile between like software, like from like programmer to like sort of entrep like entrepreneur and more like product oriented per type of person. I think, you know, today, like it's really, it's really, you know, building, building products. And, uh, you know, some engineers are very good from like getting this, you know, the specs and building, you know, building the, the actual code, building the actual product, and then like, you know, take this product to market, which I think it's, uh, it's a very, it's a very more modern uh, sort of concept compared, you know, to, uh, you know, to what was software engineer probably 50 years ago, which was much more academic and, you know, more, you know, a little bit different. Definitely. And I love how all of you were able to spotlight different parts of where software engineering has come from in software in general and how, where, and how it's taken us to where we are now. And with that momentum, Pooja, I'd love to go to you first on this. Where do you see software growing and where do you see it going? And what's the biggest potential and the trends that we should be looking for in the next three to five years? Sure. I think balancing between personalization, ads, and privacy is going to be an interesting problem that, that we have to collectively solve. With a surge in exchanging user data for utility, the, the privacy lines are very fuzzy today. With GDPR and more recently CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, we are beginning to see some privacy regulations but without the mandate of explainability, there is little accountability for products that use your data. So I expect to see this space evolve quite a bit in the you know, three to five, in fact, in the zero to five year range. I think that, uh, yeah, I think those are excellent points. I think those are all things that we'll see evolve. I, I think over the next three to five years, I wanna echo a lot of the points that Janu made. Um, uh, with, uh, first of all, starting with the no code movement. I think we've, a lot of us have seen a lot of uh, no code platforms coming out. I've been playing with a very cool one called Node Red recently. Um, and it's a lot of, um, it doesn't mean you don't code at all. It's a lot more drag and drop and an abstraction away from what we're used to where there's building blocks. And if you're more aware of the code, you can go in and make edits but it does allow for um, developers to be to work faster um, especially in smaller applications that's great um, i also see a lot of and we see in our developer survey on stack overflow just a trend towards devops uh, this year devops was the fastest growing field and the highest paying uh, roles out there and so looking at a world where um, instead of sysadmins that are very deep on servers you're seeing people that are just in charge of managing the cloud, which is really uh, fascinating. And then lastly, I'll say another thing I've noticed um, about the future of software engineers in general is um, I often make the joke that I'm of the generation of people that became a software developer because we had no friends and we found computers. Um, and uh, that's no longer the case. I think the people going into software development are very uh, diverse in what uh, is passionate, what they're passionate about, whether it's they're artistic and they love art and they love front end, or they have found it um, because of different communities they were a part of, uh, or um, some people are very motivated by the money and they'll, you'll find, and you know, they probably would have become a stockbroker in the 80s and now they're becoming software developers in, in these years. So I think that the community and what is important to them in general is changing. I think we'll continue to see that changing over the next few years. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned DevOps because uh, I, 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 think, I think there is, uh, for my opinion, there are two, uh, there are two things that are going to, to be really like the future here. And so definitely, it's the known uh, known coding movement, 
I think you we could you we could like sort of explain that more like just broadly as a front end. I think um, the future of software engineering is going to be front end, and it's going to be uh, because the platform it's what we are building right now. So the DevOps, I think it's more like in the short terms, but I would say that like you know maybe. There is gonna there is gonna be still needs of DevOps, but I think the DevOps role is it, gonna be more like what happened to the electronical engineers at some point because uh, you know we, we are gonna build the platform that are gonna allow people to just like build their application with basically no lines of code and that's or with very little lines of code and that's what basically Steve was saying right and so I really think the future it, it, it's gonna be like. UI, it's going to be building the interface, building the product uh, without really have to think about too much uh, data engineering or infrastructure. And, and it, you know, the DevOps was one of these roles which sort of like uh, is in the middle, you know, between, uh, you know, the, the, the engineer and, and, and the system admin, right? So, because right now we are in this, in this moment where we, we got rid of like the pure like concept of servers where you you know you had like uh, uh, someone that SSH into a server and set up all the you know tons of things that and you know that are very hard and 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 very hard to maintain and very sort of like unsecure uh, unsafe if not done in the proper way. Uh, but I, I really think the DevOps it, it, it's go it's gonna it's gonna be a support role that it's gonna be here for for a certain amount of years until we manage to build the platform for just then allow people to just build their software on top of that. And, uh, you know, there is going to always be DevOps, of course, like there is always going to be electronic engineers, but the demand is going to be much less. That's, that's what I think. And I really think that, the, you know, front end UI, that's good. That's going to be like the really the, the future because we, we're going to build more and more customer face application and less platform. And so to build customer focus application, you, you need UI because that's what the user wants. So, but, but no coding, uh, it's definitely the, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to explode. Uh, building on the, uh, DevOps angle, I, I, I completely agree with, uh, what Sarah and, uh, uh Jacobo both said, um, I, I, I'm fascinated with the journey we have seen, right? From sysadmin to DevOps. And now when we say full stack engineers, it's really full stack in the sense of front end and back end. And I expect that, and I'm beginning to see this, the early phases of this, but I expect that full stack will soon start meaning a lot of DevOps work as well, you know, thinking about uh, resilience and scale and availability. And so I think over time we'll see that rolling into full stack and the meaning of full stack will I think expand in the in the uh, upcoming years. Yeah, I think there's a lot of like specialization, right? Um, and I think that there's an argument for figuring out what that is and like um, figuring out what's coming over the horizon. Like I changed careers. I didn't start out as a software engineer. I spent the first seven years as a, like a New York City public school teacher, which is the farthest thing from software engineering ever. Um, and I went into the front end stuff. I started out as like a full stack engineer and then I went into the front end part of it in like 2013, 2014, when it was still like a little like rich client side apps were still a little bit of a fad. Um, and I think like kind of finding one of those kind of early things and becoming a specialist in it super early um, had been a like a large scale career advantage um, for me. And I think like I, you know, for my last two jobs, it has been playing, you know, trying to tie it back into the no code thing. It's been playing with the idea. I work at, you know, Twilio is an API company. SendGrid was an API company, right? But the hypothesis that there are more non-engineers in the world than there are engineers. Right, and so it like stands to reason that for companies that want to grow their like uh, total addressable market, right, like being able to provide like great user interfaces on top of like um, really, and they're both like you know software as a service, infrastructure as a service companies, like combining those different aspects, I think becomes a lot of the of the next kind of like phase of the of the industry.
So the common thing I'm seeing with all of your insights, if we were to pull them all together, you know, we're shifting from one area to another and, and it's getting distributed on from there once we get hit that inflection point. So Tanu, I'm gonna to go to you first on this, but what's the best way for a software engineer to anticipate and prepare for these industry-wide changes and innovations? Um, great question, Brian. But before I answer that, I just wanted to put in two cents into the you know three to five year uh, future of software engineering. I know we talked a lot about low code or no code uh, movement, but uh, I want to make a pitch for video. Video is growing like crazy. It's helped us tie this um, uh, COVID-19 uh, um, uh, backlash. So, you know, that's, that's really something uh, to look at if you're interested in, uh, in, in, in a tech career. Um, how do you keep yourself, uh, how do you ant anticipate these and prepare for this industry and these in innovations? To me, I think the most fundamental thing is that uh, you stay curious and you stay open-minded. It's all about continuous learning. If I go back and look at, you know, I never thought I'd last for two decades, but I look at it, I'm still relevant, I'm still doing things. But the common thread for me has been as I've kept my domain more or less common. So going back to what I said, I like building products. Um, I like building communication products. I just happen to get into them. And I've done a whole slew of them from voice to video, to video streaming, to conferencing. And uh, keeping the problem domain the same has been, a common, uh, has been a common thread. I've been able to bring that experience with me, yet I've been able to move from technology to technology. You know, we used to write assembly language, then we were writing, uh, we were creating embedded products, and now we're doing the whole video streaming on the internet in, in the cloud. So just being open, uh, minded and curious, wanting to learn, continuous learning, I think is the only way to stay relevant in this industry. I'd say if you're of a growth mindset person, you're set. A thousand percent agree, Tanu. Like, uh, yes, a curious mind. I think that's how we've all gotten to where we are, which is, yes, I completely agree with that. Um, I think, you know, just to take a different angle at this, I kind of look at you know, in, in my industry and, and really like at a higher level view of like, what are the disruptors uh, in the industries right now, right? And paying very close attention to the things that are going to disrupt. So I, I've used this analogy a lot, a lot of times, like years ago when, you know, we had the taxi cabs and everyone's doing that and that was just status quo. And all of a sudden Uber came around and, and really disrupted the entire industry. And with that, if we're keeping up to date with some of the things that are, are driving those disruptions, we're gonna stay ahead of the technology and we're gonna see what people are actually going to need. And with Uber, it became a platform, for example, in order to drive, um, not just drive, but drive other um, abilities through that platform. Now Uber Eats and they're probably gonna take Seamless for what it's worth and things like that. So it's really looking at um, you know, the industry right now. I would actually take a look at COVID at the moment and say, how is this disrupting our industry at the moment? Going back to what Tanu said about video. Video, we are now gonna be hitting constraints with bandwidth, scalability, and all of those kind of things. So for me, I'm looking at video and health services and how do we actually potentially modernize these things to go to the cloud because we need to scale these things at, 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 at great loads, right? So things like that. So I, I, would, I would more look into the types of industries and how we're disrupting that and, and um, really drive to stay in touch with that because that's gonna be the forefront of where we need to focus on technology. We need to look at you know, the massive amounts of data that's coming through right now. So how do we actually use that data in appropriate matter? Um, how do we use machine learning and AI to actually uh, curate those things and really start <laughs> driving some of these algorithms. So yeah, no, definitely industry-wide uh, reading, looking at all of those things and, and figuring what that looks like. So I think, you know, I, I want to answer this question and, and, and keep it really short. I think there are two things that to be prepared for future change, you, you, you know, as a software engineer or like as a future software engineer, you have, you have to do, and uh, you have to learn the fundamentals. Like you, you need to do it really well. You, you have to understand, you know, 
we all love JavaScript and, you know, I, I'm a JavaScript engineer. I do a lot in Node.js, but you, you know, I, when I started coding and I learned how to code, I, I learned how to code in C and uh, that really, that really helped because you, you, you learn one of the, you know, like the, a very low level programming language that allow you really to understand like how the basic works. And, you know, when you understand pointer, when you understand, you know, what's a class is and how it works and how it's stored in memory and you understand, you know, the, how man, um, memory management works and like how, what's compilation is, um, that will really allow you to, to, to go really, really far in your career. Um, and then also, again, it's really uh, less more, less focusing on the programming language itself. It's really trying to understand how thing works. Uh, when you're doing something from like building a mobile app to uh, you know a front end component using React, try really to understand why you're doing that. And it's not just like going to Stack Overflow, which is very useful, and just you know, you know, using solutions that you find online, just copy and paste things. That that's great. I mean, solve a lot of tons of problems that you know I had in my in my career. But after that, you really try to understand why. And uh, that, that, that's really, and you know, go back to the definition of software engineer. You're solving problems, so you have, you have to understand the problem you're solving. And when you're you're doing something, you have to understand what you're doing and understand how the the things that you're using to solve, you know, to to solve the problem you're trying to solve works. And you know, if you have that logic, if you have that mindset, it doesn't matter what's coming up in the future: blockchain, machine learning, you know, uh, rockets that you know go. Uh, a different light speed or whatever you you will you will be there you will you know you, you will be able to like to build these things and um and that and that's really like th this mindset to allow you to to migrate across different discipline and different specialization uh, because at the end of the day the, you know the, the underlying the underlying um um goal it, it's the same it's you're solving problems so you have to understand the things you the, the tools that you're using and how they works to, to stay uh, relevant with all the changes that are happening in uh, technology, learning, like uh, the others mentioned, is, is really critical. Uh, I, re I also recommend that you go back to the fundamentals, whether you have a computer science degree or not, having a solid foundation and, and a deep understanding of you know, software fundamentals, data structures, computational complexity, problem solving techniques is paramount. It, it's, it's very easy to get caught up in the you know latest fad and just understand enough to be able to you know um, get that mobile app out the door. But um, I think it's a good time to go back to the roots, and that helps build the expertise and confidence to you know learn newer things as they come and go. Definitely, and you know preparing for what's to come in the future and really making the most out of our current skills and the things that are available to us and the resources. Uh, Sarah, first, uh, for people who are looking to break into the field and, and trying to get a job in software, how can they translate their classroom or previous workplace knowledge to a job as a software engineer? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So I, I've worked with a lot of uh, new developers um, and it's one of my favorite things to do. And uh, one thing that I love about people that have switched careers mid-career, um, like Steve, um, is that their prior knowledge is so valuable in the roles of software developers. For example, I worked with a developer who had a long background in politics. Um, and his role in politics really helped prepare him for navigating um, commu communications internally to our organization. Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. I work closely with someone who did ad sales before they were in software development. Um, and as a company, we also do ad sales. So their job as doing ad, ad sales gave them a lot of wisdom when it came to working with the product team to determining the best solutions um, to be built. So all this experience becomes really valuable um, when you become a developer. So I always coach people 
um, when they're looking for their first time role to build off the experience that they have in the past because that's always encouraging when you're looking for someone that's a software developer on your team that has even when they're especially when they're new if they have expertise to doing something related to your company that's super valuable um, and as far as taking your classroom experience um, and knowledge to the workforce i think that um, the best thing to take from the classroom to the workforce is just the understanding that you're learning um, and this is a learning environment i think it's really hard to, to prepare for a job in software whether you're studying for computer science or going to a boot camp because there's no way you can learn all the things you're going to need to know um, as a software developer um, in a classroom. But uh, one mistake I see often from new coders is, you know, just the, um, uh, first of all, there's always a lot of fear. Uh, what if I mess up? What if I don't know the things that I, I need to know? The thing is, you're not going to know the things you need to know. You're just not. And the best thing that you can do to set yourself up for success is just uh, understand that you're going to be con you're going to be learning for the next 30 years in this field. You know, this uh, one thing I see often about software developers uh, about five to 10 years into their career is they say, I'm just I didn't expect all this learning. I don't know if I can keep learning. And the people that love learning, they're just amped. They keep going. Um, so just preparing yourself for, you know, a long time of learning, understanding that you need to be opening um, and never pretending that you, oh, and one more, sorry. I think a really important thing is that this is a really senior developer thing and it doesn't sound like something you learn as a senior developer, but sometimes it takes people 10 years to realize this. It is never bad to say, I don't know. I think the most senior thing I see people do is say, the thing that I learned after 15 years in this, or 20 years in this rather, is I am, you know, someone talks to me about an acronym I've never heard before. And I say, what is that? You know, I'm so interested. What are you talking about? Um, and when I was new, I was just so afraid to say something like that. Cause I was like, they're gonna think I'm an idiot. This is probably something I'm supposed to know. And now I know I just can't know everything. So uh, really as a new developer, one of the real level ups that you could have is just, if someone's talking about something, you don't know what they're talking about, say, what is that thing I'd really like to know more? Like I could not agree more with everything you just said, Sarah, um, which makes my follow up really hard. Um, but I think, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, at the end of the day, we are people trying to solve problems for people using computers. And I like, it, it always like pains me when I see a brand new, either a career changer or someone kind of getting to the first time, uh, try to put themselves away. Cause like, why write code now? Right, like no, you you beautiful, beautiful human. Like you have all these other skills that are super, super important, uh, either adjacent skills or in that in that product domain. And I think a lot of it, like like, there, it is hard to understate um, how important some of the interpersonal skills are. Right, you see people who are like uh, wizard ninja guru, whatever software engineers who can't like can't make the change that they want to make in the organization or can't get people enrolled in their ideas even if they're right and that becomes a limiting factor more than your ability to spit out some you know c or javascript or ruby or what have you this idea of like can you actually like gain enrollment in your in your ideas and your initiatives can you make the change that benefits the organization that becomes the differentiator between somebody who can you know whose impact is limited to the number of hours in a day and someone who can have this like greatly outsized impact in the organization and on top of saying like i don't know in a conversation which is an incredibly powerful thing and like let's not underplay the amount of confidence that that um projects i also think that is one sometimes one of the most valid uh, um, code review comments. I don't understand what this line is doing. Can you explain it to me? Right? Because by definition, if you don't understand it, somebody else doesn't understand it. And that engineer who, when the context leaves their brain, like a month from now, will also be in the same camp as you. Right? And just, you know, I think what we think about as uh, imposter syndrome can, you know, has a a second side to it, which does become that vulnerability becomes a certain confidence to be comfortable enough in your own skin to be like, I, yeah, hi, can you explain this to me? I don't truly understand. And I think it is, it is useful to, that makes you human. It makes it easier to make that change and get enrollment as well. And it always pains me when I see people like put that part of themselves away because they are limiting themselves. 
So yeah, I, I really do agree with both uh, of you, like Sarah and, and Steve, about this. I think you know, being able to just say, "Hey, I, I don't know," it, it, it's it, you know, it, it's a very useful thing, and it, it, it will you know, it will brings you very far in your career. Uh, so I want to give you just though an advice for you know, if, if you're a junior, how you know to become a good senior. It's yes, sure, you you can say, "Hey, I don't know." But also one thing that I really encourage, you know, uh, you know, everyone is from like senior folks, but especially junior folks is like trying to try to think first. Uh, so if you, so it's most likely you're not going to know something, especially if you're at the beginning of your career. But so before going out there and ask right away, trying to so try to figure it out. There is like there are so many powerful tools like from Stack Overflow from to Google where you can really try to look the answer out there, and then if you really don't you know if you really can't figure it out then go and you know look for help from like more senior people. But I think uh, something that you know I we you know I I lead a I lead a team of like several engineers and I have junior folks and you know when. When I see people that are really trying hard to understand something that they don't know, um, I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it because it really it really makes it you know look like that that you care about and you know you're not just there for you know you know just do your job. You're really you're really more into the learning part. You're, you're really into the learning part where you you're really trying hard to solve the problem and then you of course if you don't know after you know if you can't come up with us with a proper solution then you know you you go get out there and and get help but i think it's really important that you start from reading well the documentation of the you know if there is doc around the things you're doing read the doc try to understand the documentation um you know look for the answer uh in you know online sources and then go and you know try to seek help of people because Time, human time is very expensive. So, you know, trying, you know, you should try and kind of limit that if, if you can find the solution by yourself. And that will also, um, you know, sort of like make your brain, uh, you know, evolving, expanding more and, you know, making the learning process e easier for in the next time you're gonna, you're gonna encounter, a, you know, a problem. Definitely. And, you know, moving forward and trying to get to the, those next steps, crucially important. So segue over to uh, our audience Q&A. Uh, I think here we're gonna go with our, our first one uh, from Mark. Uh, his advice, his questions about uh, returning engineers and um, he detoured into product management for a couple of years and wants to return to uh, more of a hands-on software role. So uh, Cassie, I think you, you wanted to answer this one. What's the best way to navigate that perceived gap? Sure. Um, I love the I love that you said the word perceived gap because I think the amount of experience that you have um, as a product um, a product manager and and any other experience is so important in general and that perceived gap I, I think is very much perceived because I think a lot of uh, what the folks on the on the panel have said already is um, there are fundamentals and foundational things that we need to know, right? And we learn them in school, we learn them on the job, we actually learn how to be, and I, I focus on the product thinking, the customer centricity, really driving to what is actually going to be the best for your customer. And so those are the kind of things where I would say that experience is super important um, in, in any role that you have, we're really thinking about those outcomes. Um, I think though, it, in terms of, you know, trying to, go deeper hands on and I you know I talk about this I go back and forth all the time like from being a manager to going back to hands on I get very itchy on all aspects because I want to create change in organizations but I also want to code um, I think one of the things that I've actually done is really two, two things is one with our experience what we know of the industry now like I, I actually have a lot of projects on my own that I have just wonderful ideas and uh, you know as a project uh, product manager I'm sure you have many ideas as well and and to stay up to speed with some of the latest and greatest um, I, I definitely tend to build out a lot of my own infrastructure as code, for example, in AWS or in GCP um, that's spinning up my own instance that's pulling down like 
you know, stock prices for myself, because that's actually what I'm interested in. And so those are my weekend activities, just to stay kind of hands on and really understand the entire ecosystem that I'm actually really interested in. Um, I think gener like generally speaking, that's actually the way I learn. I think everybody on this group and everybody in the audience should really think about their own ways of learning because there's so many resources out there and don't worry you don't have to do all of them right you don't have to watch every video or read every book or read every blog you have to actually know and see what you're adapted to and how you best learn and how you actually best practice so for me i like putting together projects right and and getting a test of everything some people love reading some people love exercises boot camps all of those things and i would say like be true to yourself. Don't be influenced by, well, all these people are taking this boot camp, so I must take it, right? Like, think about what you can best learn and figure out like what that actually is because the resources are plenty out there. So that would be some of my advice around that. Um, I can add some more for Mark. Um, I'm going to go to the other extreme and say it's not even a perceived gap. It's a perceived uh, advantage that you're bringing to the table. I think that's how you want to perceive it. Um, like I use my example where I've kept the domain kind of common across uh, when I change technologies, the, it's easy to bring that experience. And even if it was unrelated experience, you know, like Steve being a teacher, there's so many other uh, valuable skills that you bring into, uh, into the workplace, which uh, uh, we, we sometimes don't sell very well. And I think what you have to look at is not just the job description, but really think about what is it that you can do to solve that problem that people are hiring for. And perhaps they haven't thought of things that you can help them solve either. So yes, you can be hands-on, you can practice and learn. And you know, we, we all talked about not being up to speed with everything. So everyone needs to learn all the time. Um, again, I, I would encourage you to sell that as a perceived advantage of, uh, of that you bring to the table. All right, great. So we also have two questions. They're very similar. So I'm going to ask both and we're going to go with uh, Sarah on first answer. Uh, first question is from Matthew. And uh, what is the best advice you give to someone looking to land uh, his or her first junior software engineering role? And then Corey, uh, he is a boot camp grad and uh, he's seeing a lot of uh, COVID hiring freezes. So how is that going to affect hiring prospects? Uh, both good questions. So the first thing I always tell people, whether they just graduated from a boot camp or university, is it's going to take you six months. Um, and if you need to get another job with those, in those six months to give yourself time, or um, uh, whatever you need to do to be able to make it six months, um, what I've seen in the past is it takes an average of six months, sometimes maybe less, it could happen in a week, but just to prepare yourself, um, apply consistently and often. Um, when I've looked for jobs in the past and I always recommend uh, apply to at least five jobs a day, um, put great cover letters with them, be really thoughtful. Um, don't uh, do 50 in one day and then not again for a week, just uh, you know, really focus and take your time. As far as breaking into the field, I think, um, getting involved in open source work is a really great way to do that. So GitHub has a really great uh, tag for issues. It is, you'll see good first issue. And sometimes it open source uh, projects aren't even about uh, coding. For example, um, I work with the OpenJS Foundation. And right now the OpenJS Foundation needs someone to help them write a letter for new members of the foundation. And it has nothing to do with code. Um, but that's an, the good first issue on their repository. So um, if you can find open source, find that first issue for yourself. Um, another thing I've seen happen often is people that get involved in open source projects start to get to know the other people on the open source projects and start to, um, and when they know that you're job hunting, they can be helpful in that way. So having a community around you is also very helpful. So those are the those are the top three things I say I would focus on if, um, if uh, as ways to set yourself apart as well as uh, get your foot in the door. Some of the things I think about um, are, you know, having, when I worked at Turing, you know, we graduated a lot of uh, 
boot camp graduates. I mean, that's what we did. Um, but like thinking about like, you know, a lot of the advice we gave would become very like, it would become generic advice. Well, every student would follow the same advice because that's, you know, it's again, it's microeconomics, right? And so the challenge that I would give when someone would reach out to me, even today when I uh, talk with graduates, which is figure out what you can do that no one else is doing. Um, and I think uh, to build on what Sarah said, like community is incredibly important. I think open source, like going to meetups, like I was lucky enough to live in New York City um, like 10 years ago when I was kind of starting out and like just knowing, like meeting lots of people just by going to things was like incredible, like invaluable. Um, you know, at the time, I don't know if this is still true, I can't speak to it, but like, you know, you'd go to a meetup and it would be like kind of um, industry, like, um, you know, like very, very like accomplished people giving these talks. And you'd also see some some really new engineers giving talks. In Denver, um, it is not as concentrated, right? And so like a lot of the advice is go to a meetup, but in a smaller community, my advice is like, yeah, sure, everyone gets the advice of go to a meetup. Why don't you speak at the meetup? Right, because everyone, like a lot of the other people going there, like they might not have heard that technology regardless of how long they've been in the industry. And a lot of people are brand new, right? And that kind of like, what is that next thing that you can do? Like um, that is a little bit above and beyond the kind of uh, standard uh, advice. And that, that's gonna be really, really different depending on the situation that you're in. And uh, one of my favorite books is this book called A Beautiful Constraint, which is kind of like taking like whatever the constraint is in this case, maybe it's like hiring freezes in COVID-19, right? Actually using that kind of like in, in the question of like, okay, given this, right? Like there are a lot of places that are doing hiring phrases, but there might also might be a lot of places that are getting like newly, um, newly interested in remote work where like three months ago, they're like, well, we don't hire remote, right? And all of a sudden, like, uh, like oh, you have all these companies changing their tune. So in every constraint, there's also an opportunity, right? And so how do you, how do you like crack those open and like begin to shift uh, the way we look at some of those constraints to actually be a new set of opportunities as well? Yeah, so I think, you know, you're, you know, you guys got already pretty good advice here, but um, I think uh, one thing that I would do, uh, if I could go back in time, one thing that I could do when I was uh, like, you know, at the beginning of my career, I would have got a job in one of the big company, um, just because I think uh, you know, it, it, it eventually is a little bit harder, but, um, you know, it will, it will, I think it, it's more, it gives you more, it's more valuable, uh, for a junior person to work uh, in one of these big companies than working for startups. I think, you know, I might, what I did in my career is that I worked for startups and then I worked for, uh, for big companies. And if I could go back, I would do, I would work for big companies and eventually like later on in my career, I would work for startups. And uh, just because in big companies, you learn more like, uh, you, you know, it's, it's a different environment. It's, it's a, the learning process, it's different. And I think you, you work really with, uh, with people that have patience and time to teach you things. When you work in startups, people are really focused just on building the product and they don't have much time to, you know, to follow up with you. So, you know, going back to, you know, what we were talking about that it's, it's good to, to ask questions and, you know, to say, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's much better to say, I don't know in, in big companies than say it in, in the startups for me. I mean, like you just find, uh, you will just find more people that have uh, really the time and, and the experience to answer you to those questions. All right. And we have one more question from Wad. Uh, if a new technology was invented that will cancel programming as we know it, would you switch to that solution or keep developing software programs to compete with it? And I believe Pooja would like to share her insights on this. Firstly, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, one of the things that excites me about software in general today is how pervasive software has become, right? This allows many the luxury to choose the domain that they're most passionate about, which could be search, video streaming, communication, entertainment, hospitality, healthcare, autonomous driving, and now space exploration, 
if you tell me that you know we are now in a uh, world where we don't have to program firstly congratulations either you know everything's doomed or we have done really well um i think if that happens then i will be hopefully involved with the technology that has replaced programming um i i am trying to envision a scenario where all of this is automated but i'm sure there's some effort gone into building that automation which is roughly what we do today but at, at a smaller scale and um, and i would probably be a part of the team that's doing you know that's building this to replace uh, programmers as we know it definitely and you know, i appreciate all of you answering these these not just complex but realistic questions and sharing uh, all of your knowledge and your experience and sharing it with our audience really really do appreciate it so if we're going to end on a really good note how about we do this um if you were to give your younger self one piece of advice so one on working as a software engineer or working in software in general what would it be and why so Tanu, I believe you wanted to take a uh, first stab at this one. Yes, uh, I'll go first. I was going to say, I was going to tell my younger self to take more risks early on in my career. But after listening to this panel, I actually want to reiterate what Sarah and Steve said. <clears throat> Ask questions. Don't be afraid of asking questions. If someone cannot explain the, the, the thing that they're talking about in software in simple language, the product or the technology, there's something wrong. Ask. I think that's my biggest takeaway. Uh, that's a great one. I, I think if I were to give myself advice, younger Cassie advice, it's really uh, embrace change, right? Like everything is always changing and it's, and don't be so rigid in, in your ways of thinking. I've definitely been very rigid and, uh, and it'll, it'll stop you from opening your mind and thinking outside of the box and those types of things. So definitely embrace change. Everything is always changing. Even like in the last four months, things have been changing. So be able to adapt to those kind of things. Uh, I, I have to say that, you know, my, my advice, is, uh, the advice I would give myself where, you know, it's very similar to your Cassie is like embrace change. Do not be too rigid. Uh, at the beginning of my career, I was really like, uh, I mean, I'm still like, you know, kind of person that when he thinks is right, he thinks is right. And then you have to prove me that I'm wrong. Otherwise I'm going to still think I'm right, but like more, you know, more flexible in, you know, accepting other people's opinions, uh, on about like architecture stuff. And, um, you know, it, this is actually things that I, in, you know, I learned really during my career, I, I really learned, you know, how to be more flexible, how to listen more people, how to be more patient in explaining things and explaining why I, I choose to do, uh, you know, to, I choose to, to code something in a certain way or architect something in a certain way. So it's really like, it's a, it's a software engineering is, is not just about solving problem. It's a human job. It's you deal with people all the time. And it's really about like, uh, you know, have a lot of respect for, for the people that works with you. I mean, it's, this is very, is, a, is, a, is an advice that it's, it's, you know, it's very, it's can be, uh, you know, it's very useful for any kind of other jobs, but, you know, in particular for software engineers, where you work with so many talented people that, you know, we are, we all are right somehow. Right. So it's really trying to, to listen more, uh, and, you know, just, just, get the human conversation, get human relationships strong. And that's something that, you know, I, it wasn't super clear for me at the beginning. And it's something that, you know, it's much more clear now. And, you know, if I could learn that before in my career, it would have helped a lot. I had to change my answer multiple times after everyone spoke. Um, so here's my latest answer. Um, I think it's worth making a decision um, whether or not you want to be the smartest person in the room or if you wanna be the person that everyone wants to come to to bounce ideas off of and collaborate with and being creative, right? And those are probably two different paths and two different skill sets. I mean, and one would argue having that like mul multiplicative influence is probably better than being the smartest person in the room and figuring out how do you cultivate that early and often. 
Steve, you got creative and improvised. Uh, I'm going to go with my initial uh, gut response. And Tanu, it's very similar to what, what you were going to go with. Uh, I would go back and tell my, my younger self to take more risks. I, in, in my early career, I always waited to you know, check all the boxes before I applied to a, you know, to a position or, or even just said, I'm, you know, I'm ready for this next bigger project. And uh, I would go back and tell myself, well, you, you know, 60%, you know, 70%, it's fine. That's, that's good enough. Now I'm on the other side where I'm constantly interviewing folks and I look at the job requirements where we say, you know, required skills. And I'm like, really, do we require, you know, these 20 bullet points? Uh, and and, and uh, I, if, if folks are listening here and thinking of where they should apply, then I would encourage for you to not wait to check, you know, every one of those um, bullet points. I'm smiling because I was just realizing that my advice to my younger self would be good advice for my current self. And that is, uh, <laughs> that is let yourself be junior. Um, and I don't mean, uh, so I'll explain. Uh, so uh, my, I think I often in the beginning was uh, aiming for that next step, right? Like I want to be, I, I, what is my, what is next? How am I going to get promoted? How am I going to go to my next role? Like what is, like just you just like beeline for that instead of sitting back and saying, um, I'm gonna be junior and I'm gonna learn and I'm gonna learn from people that are better than me and I'm gonna take my time. Um, so uh, I think that that is uh, something I still struggle with. <laughs> just hearing from all of you and, and from where you've come from to where you are now and how you would try to help not just yourself, but also other people in the process is just so inspiring and really incredible again to have all of you here. And I can't thank all of you enough. It, it really means a lot. And I'm sure that all of uh, our attendees who are in the meeting right now and also who are gonna watch this really, really do appreciate all of your insights. So thank you. Thanks for having us. It's really amazing. And you know, before we end, I'm going to throw in one little thing. Uh, so for all of you who are watching this and for all of you who are going to watch it, uh, we do have uh, other events that we put on. So aside from software engineering, we also have coming up in July, uh, Future of Data Science and the Future of UX and Design. So if any of you are interested, feel free to check out our website, linerun.co. Uh, also, we are exploring, in a, aside from the professions, the actual ecosystems. And so next week is feature of New York City tech and startups. And then we're pretty much going to go in succession of the largest tech ecosystems in the world, starting with Boston and Austin, and uh, really trying to understand what are the opportunities and what are the career process, what are things you need to worry about. Uh, from a high level. So some events for our community to look forward to. So again, couldn't, can't thank all of you enough uh, for being here. Really do appreciate it. And uh, for those of you who asked about uh, connecting with everyone on LinkedIn, so you're going to get uh, this recorded video uh, when it's uploaded to YouTube, you'll get the link, you'll uh, follow up with an email, and you'll also get everyone's uh, link to their uh, LinkedIn profile so you can connect with everyone here. So again, thank you all so much, both panelists and attendees for being here. Uh, hope everyone has uh, a wonderful rest of your week and we will all stay in touch, I'm sure, and use the wonderful advice that we have uh, learned today from you and make our careers and our communities better. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.